uh, and thanks to everyone uh, involved in organizing this really uh, uh, important event. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to refer to some general issues in the understanding of, of, of war and, and violence, but uh, I'm, I am going to, to try and focus on by way of illustration but on the uh, the context for for the current war uh, on ukraine and i've subtitled this the, the ghosts of 1989 and i uh, want to put the current situation in the context of the the, the very significant events around the collapse of communism which released huge geopolitical forces that, that are still structuring Europe and wider global society and will probably continue to do so for some decades. There are global transitional dynamics in complex interplay uh, of post-socialist, post-colonial and, and neo-colonial relations and added to this now threats of, of global recession and food shortages. Uh, and as ha has been mentioned, I think uh, Sunita mentioned it, conflicts are becoming more decentralized, more chaotic, more brutal, uh, with unclear lines between paramilitaries, militaries, uh, uh, military and civilians and combatants uh, on things, for example, of the so-called um, Zelonia Cheloveki, the, the little green men, the uh, Russians invading Crimea in, in uh, 2014 without insignia, uh, without identification. And why Ukraine? Um, Ukraine has been in contention since the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and in 1992, I was uh, visiting Kiev with a, a group of students from uh, from uh, Moscow State University, uh, who, uh, who were talking about, you know, the future of the post-Soviet world and, and so on. And uh, they were quite clear that, you know, Ukraine would not continue in its present form, that, 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 that it would be partitioned between a Russian and uh, a an Ukrainian part. So this has been on the agenda, so to speak, for, for some time. And, and so 1989, I think, released multiple systemic crises and was the product of multiple systemic crises. Uh, the, 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 the slow collapse of the post-World War II order and disorder beginning in the 1970s uh, with the, 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 the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, new geopolitical systems, regimes of local and global accumulation, struggles for hegemony over physical space, cyberspace, and, and, uh, and influence. And within this collapse of the Soviet Union was an unintended consequence, and therefore in some ways a systemic consequence, of Gorbachev's attempt at counter-reformation, the attempt to shore up the Soviet Union actually had the unintended consequences uh, of, of uh, pro setting in train the, the, the process of its collapse. And within this, something I want to emphasize, which connects with broader themes on sociology of violence that I've, I've worked on, uh, is what uh, Karaganov uh, uh, calls the, the mobilization of shame. He talks about a Weimar syndrome, shame of, of, uh, of a defeated adversary. Uh, uh, Timothy Schneider talks about tragic suffering and the politics of eternity, the eternal victimhood. This is something that, that appears a lot in Putin's speeches, uh, the, the mobilization of a, of a shame of, of, of defeat. Now, if we look at Kant, the Kantian triangle of peace, you know, there was quite a lot of optimism in the aftermath of the, the end of communism that and particularly through the expansion of the European Union, that, you know, Republican constitutions, international trade and interdependence, federations of interdependent republics, this would bring about long-term peace. And I think Sinichinism mentioned this, this too. Uh, and, and this now, with the situation we're in now, raises, of course, a different question whether we're seeing a return to the endless European civil wars of, 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 the, of the last thousand years or so, can only really pose this as a, as a question now uh, that, that I think the current situation uh, uh, confronts us with. 
Um, and I've put together a sort of a, a sketchy model, which is by no means exclusive, uh, on some of the, the social conditions for war and extreme violence. Extreme violence is perhaps more my area of uh, research than, than war. I'm not going to talk through this now that there's nowhere near enough time. And anyway, it, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but there's just one or two issues here that, that I'd like to uh, I'd like to highlight shame dynamics uh, as part of the, the cultural histories of, of, of collective memories, particularly collective memories of, of enemies. I think if you, if those of you familiar with my work on violence will, will know this is something that I, I, I talk about quite a bit. Um, uh, regime type, uh, authoritarian as opposed to democratic regimes, as we saw in the Kantian uh, uh, concept just now, uh, but particularly, I mean, there's 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 uh, work that suggests that that authoritarian regimes are more likely to gamble for uh, gamble for resurrection if they're losing a war, do something very dramatic uh, if if, if the, the war is is going badly. And of course, there's been a lot of concerns about that in the current context. An ideologization of conflict uh, is something I want to, to to mention a little bit more, a uh, regime of gender heteronormativity and masculinization is an important prelude to, to, uh, uh, to war. And the politicization of war, as, as, as Sam Ellen uh, talks about, and that these can lead particularly to extreme violence and the possibility of genocide, something else that's been raised in relation to the Russian uh, uh, invasion. So but with those sort of very sketchy ideas in mind, I just want to, to look at a couple of, of issues in relation to the, the current, the background to the current uh, conflict. Well, for one, the the post the process of post Soviet ideologization, and I, I referred to this as Putin Schmidt, uh, 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 looking also at the work of a very good book of David Lewis on on the growth of authoritarianism in in Russia, uh, um, and the the influence of Schmittian thinking, uh, particularly through uh, theorists like Alexander Dugin, uh, who who develops this concept of friend foe consciousness that the Eurasian landmass versus the global Atlanticist, the the land empire versus the sea empire, is is, is a recurrent theme in his thinking and others like Alexander Filipov. Um, and, and this, the, the, the global Atlanticism is contrasted with Russia's civilizazione pohod, the, 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 the kind of special way, the special civilizational focus of, of, of Russia in terms of, of the, the guardian of Pravo, which is not, not in the, is, is right, but not in the sense of a rational legal system, but much more in the a Schmittian sense of the, the right of the sovereign. Uh, much more like Weber's concept of plebiscitary uh, democracy. So you get status nationalism, exceptionalism, a conflict of orthodox values against the cosmopolitan West, heteronormativity and patriarchy, I will refer to again in a minute if, if there's still time, uh, and preoccupation with sovereignty versus enemies within, if you think about the, the persecution of NGOs with any overseas contacts in, in Russia. Uh, and here Dugan is, is talking about, Dugan is talking, so saying we are fighting against the, the liberal world order. We're not attacking uh, uh, Ukraine specifically, we're, we're, we're fighting the, the liberal world order. We have no possibility to show that Huntington was right other than by attacking Ukraine, obviously a reference to clash of civilizations. This is a war of ideas, he said, if Russia does not win it will destroy the world. Um, and, and this is, I think, important themes in, in uh, post-Soviet ideologization, uh, a kind of you know, sense of a Deutsche Sonderweg, a, a specific uh, path, but you know, crucially one without borders. I mean, Dugin talks about a Eurasian space, a Eurasian traditional land space uh, without borders, post-borders. But I think if, one, if we look at the process of post-Soviet ideologization, uh, which, you know, picking up 
some of the themes I raised earlier about the, the sort of preconditions for, for conflict. Um, I, what is interesting here, I think, is, is a paradox. Now, on the one hand, you have the formation of sort of ideological systems, particularly around heteronormativity, virtual illegalization of homosexuality, domestic violence is decriminalized uh, in 2017, uh, silencing of history of Second World War sex war crimes, the mass rape by, by the Red Army and uh, the process of colonization that followed uh, the, the Second World War. So you have these strands of, of, of idealized, uh, ideologization. Uh, uh, that, that feed into a conditions for conflict, but at the same time, a kind of ideological post-ideology, uh, a replaying of the great patriotic war, as we saw in Putin's justification. Two minutes to go, Larry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, a replaying uh, of the great patriotic war, sort of first, one might say, first time as tragedy, second time as tragedy too, but with elements of farce, the, the empty signifiers of Z, the reappearance of Soviet icons in occupied territory, as you see on this tank in, in Mariupol, flying the Soviet flag, which they, which no longer has uh, has meaning other than as a symbol of domination in its own right, the reappearance of statues of Lenin, which is particularly paradoxical since Lenin is blamed with, for, for having created Ukraine in the first place. The last thing that, that I just like to bring to your attention, so I've been talking about the, the ideologization of the, the prelude to, to the conflict, but we also need to keep in mind the political economy of war. Uh, and I, what, what we see in this, uh, this, this map, uh, the, the, the darker areas are the resource intensive areas of, of, of Ukraine. This is where the, the gas fields, the oil fields and, all, uh, uh, and so on. Ah, and of course you will see these are precisely the areas to the east and south of Kiev and into Crimea that are the areas of contention. I mean, this is where the, Russia is currently attempting to consolidate its, its, its position. And so the, the, you know, the, the, the political economy of, of war is, is also very important. And I think in some of the current commentaries a rather understated aspect of the, of the whole process. Um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you.